verses 11 and 12. But as for you, man of God, shun all this. Pursue righteousness, good, godliness, faith, love, endurance, gentleness. Fight the good fight of the faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called and for which you made the good confession in the presence of many witnesses. This is the word of the Lord. Thank you, God. And now we will turn it over to Keith Wagner. How's this? Can you guys hear me okay? I'll put this down here just a little bit. If I get any feedback or something happens, please let me know. I want this to be as um, high a quality sound so everybody can hear me. Excellent. Wonderful. <laughs> Good job. Good job. So, uh, Happy New Year. Happy New Year, guys. It's so good to see everybody here. And uh, it's always such a joy for my family and I to be here with you. Uh, we really love you. And what a wonder it is to have a great service that's ordered, that you can come together and worship the Lord together. And that's what we're doing here this morning. We're gathering as a body of believers. Not only does the New Testament command us, it's not a suggestion. It says, do not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. Have you ever thought, why? Why is there a church? Why are we commanded to come to church to assemble together? Well, there's lots of great reasons for it. I'm going to go through some of those this morning. The topic of my sermon this morning is seven ways to fight the good fight. <clears throat> fight the good fight. The good fight of faith. The good fight for your soul. The good fight for joy. Like we've read, 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12 says, Fight the good fight of faith. Take hold of the eternal life to which you were called when you made your good confession in the presence of many witnesses. Did you hear that? There's a fight. We can't be deceived. As much as we want to think and believe in goodness, and believe, believing in goodness is a good thing, believe me, there's also darkness. There's an evil force out there that wants to destroy you. The Old Testament says that the enemy is like a wolf crouching at your door. The New Testament tells us that he goes around like a hungry, a roaring lion, lion, seeking whom he may devour. Guys, there's a force of darkness. And in this verse, 1 Timothy 6, 12, it says, you made a good confession in the presence of many witnesses. There's one of your reasons right there to come to church. We're like-minded people, fellow, yes, I'm going to say it, sinners. That's you, that's me. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. I don't care who you are, where you're from, how good you may be living. And we, we celebrate the good living. We're not putting that down. But we're all sinners. We're all in this boat together. You and me and all of us. We're here to help one another. And one of the issues with not coming to church is that we get in this malaise of belief that we don't think we need any help. Guys, we do. Our lives are comfortable, our lives are great. I mean, just think about just the, the, the joy of coming into this beautiful building with stained glass, running water. Now, those of you who have been in this town just a little while know what it's like to go without electricity and running water, or heat and air. It didn't take just a little bit of that, you've had enough of it. Absolutely. But you know, we live in the 1%. If you're here in this building, you are a one percenter. You live better than the richest and the most grand kings of old. All of us do. If you've ever been to a third world country, Adrienne and I had the privilege of going to Nepal, to the city of Kathmandu, a year or so ago. And let me tell you, we were out on the rooftop where we had our meeting place, and you just look over the edge 
down the people with this muddy stream of water and people out there brushing their teeth, doing their daily hygiene, squatting over this little muddy stream, living in little huts, mostly made out of tin and lean-to wood and even cardboard, any scrap that they could get. And let me tell you, these were some of the cleanest people you would ever meet. Uh, my mother grew up not too long, uh, not too far from here, uh, in a little town called Light, Arkansas. You guys ever heard of Light? Yes. Not too far from here. And uh, I've always said this about my mother. I said she had a dirt floor and you could eat off of it. She'd keep it as clean as, as it could be. But there's a whole attitude there about gratitude. And this attitude of gratitude is a part of how we fight. And I want to come down into this lesson today to talk about this. Because gratitude and joy is a part of fighting. Some of us are overcome with misery and suffering. And it's one thing to have pain and misfortune and calamity in your life, but it's another thing to suffer because of your attitude. The point about gathering together and worshiping our Lord Jesus is the word church in and of itself comes from the Greek word ekklesia, which means to be called out, to be set apart, to be a little different. And what makes us different is not just like the way we dress, perhaps, or the way we talk, even though those things can be important. It's our attitude. It's our focus. It's who we are and who we identify with deep in our hearts. In Psalm 1611, it says, In the presence there is fullness of joy. Through fullness of joy awaits us because of our hope in heaven. John chapter 15, verse 11 says, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. This is what sets us apart. So number one, when, when we realize who we are in Christ, we have an everlasting joy. And that's one of the things that makes us different. So if you want to equip yourself for the good fight, number one, realize that you are bought with a price. You're set apart. And being a part of the world of Christendom, in Christ means that immediately, no matter how hard a suffering you may go through, is you have a hope that those who don't have a hope in Christ have. So realize that all lasting joy is found in Christ. Jeremiah chapter 2 verse 13 says, For my people have committed two great evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewn out cisterns for themselves. They've broken cisterns that they can hold no water. See, this is the idea of where do we put our hope? Where do we put our joy? When we look to anything else but Jesus for lasting joy, we'll always have a broken sister. In the modern world, that means we're nothing but a crackpot. Right? And you know, if you try to pour water in a crackpot, what happens? It all leaks out. It can't hold anything. Our word sincere comes from an old word meaning that a pot is whole, that it can hold water. If you are insincere with your faith, it means you're not going to hold any water. It means you're a crackpot. It's what it means deep inside. And so the idea is that we want to put our hope in Christ. One of the things I want to do in this sermon this morning is take time to pray, to really beseech God. One of the things I firmly believe in is that we need to seek God in the Word of God, the people of God, and the Spirit of God. Through the Spirit of God is when we pray. And so if you get anything out of this sermon this morning, I want you to get this idea of how to fight. One of the ways that we fight is through praying. I believe it's one of the greatest force multipliers of all, is when we come in front of the living God. Because it's not really about our words being eloquent or us saying the right stuff. It's about realizing who we're praying to. God is the one who answers prayers. That's why prayer works. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you right now giving you joy in this meeting place as a church. I pray for a joyful life. Free us from these things, Lord, still, that might steal our joy from ineffective prayer, from an ineffective sincerity. God, give us this confidence in faith. Give us this confidence, Lord. I pray this in Jesus' name. So here's number one. Remember, I've got seven. Hold on. Number two. To fight the good fight of faith, we have to abide in Christ. This is an active thing. To abide means that we're there living in Jesus. You know, 
This is the whole idea about our focus. If you want something great in your life, first thing you gotta do is focus. There's an old saying that I love, wherever focus goes, energy flows. You know, they tell race car drivers that if you get into a spin, don't look at the wall. Because if you can imagine I'm driving and I get into a spin out and I look at the wall, guess where I'm gonna go? Right into that wall. We go where we focus. So if I focus too much on pain, if I focus on what we don't have, guess what's going to happen? I'll run smack dab into the middle of it. You want to focus like good skiers do. When you're skiing, you don't look at the tree you're going to run into. You look at the open. You look between the trees, right? Focus on where you want to go. One of the ideas of abiding in Christ is to focus on Christ. Like Peter stepping out on that water. Right? He climbed out of that boat. And as long as his eyes were on Jesus, you tell me what happened. He stayed on top of the water. The moment that his eyes were averted, right, he stopped focusing on Jesus, what happened? He began to sink. We sink in life when we take our eyes off of Jesus. Now, plenty of us have other things to focus on. We got work. We got stuff we have to do. And just like Peter walking out on that water, my understanding of that day is that that wasn't a calm, glassy sea. There was a storm going on. And in my mind, probably some water, you know, from a big wave or a crack of lightning, something very, very understandably so got his attention. Think about what's trying to steal your attention away today. I'm sure there's a lot of things that you have to do. Things that have gone wrong, whether in your own health or your life. And yes, we have to pay attention to those. But if those things are overcoming you and you're being overcome by sorrow and suffering, that's a sign and symptom that we're not taking our focus back where it needs to be. Let's pray about how to abide. Dear Heavenly Father, you make known to us the path of life. Your presence there is fulfillment and joy. Your right hand are all of the pleasures that you've given us. You've given us everything in this life, Lord. All the beauty, all the comfort, but God, we know sometimes those things can steal away our focus from you. We can take the created, Father, and replace you, the creator. I pray, God, we don't get our cart before the horse. I pray, God, that we put those in the proper order. Restore us, Father. You are our counselor, our confidant, our friend, our king, our provider, our savior. You are our Abba, our Father. You are amazing. We praise your holy name. And in Jesus, we pray this. Restore our focus upon you. Number three, how we win the good fight is by being in the Word of God. Now, what does it mean to be in the Word of God? Where Jeremiah 15, 16 says, Your words were found, and I ate them. <laughs> and your words became to me a joy and a delight in my heart. When was the last time you devoured the Word of God? Do any of us have an appetite for it at all? How much time do we really Spend in scriptures. Now remember, I'm not pointing the finger at you because look at all these I got pointed back at you. That's how it works. But really, think about it. As a counselor and as a coach, people come to me all the time and they say, Keith, I, my life is terrible. You know, I got all these things going on and one of the first things I ask them is, well, how much time and energy are you focusing? Are you investing in those things that are overcoming you? You see, we can become so focused on the problem put so much time and energy thinking about those bad things that we don't have time for any good thing in our life. Wherever focus goes, energy flows. You plant the seeds of righteousness, that's what grows. The idea is that we've got to put time into good things, into great things. And if you and I will put more time in reading, studying, praying about, rejoicing in the Word of God, just hold on. Just imagine what will happen in your life. Let's pray about the Word of God. Lord, thank you for this time you've given us to be in your Word. Standing right here in front of these good people, Father, I am deeply honored to open this Word and deliver your Word. God, help us to discover who you are, the richness, the fathoms. God, that uh, I pray that you can open us up and lead us directly to you, our great light. We know your scriptures tell us when we walk in the light as you are in the light. We will draw all men to us. God, you are a light to our path. God, and I pray that this light will divide the darkness from the enemy that seeks to beset us at all, at all 
turns. God, you promise us in James 1, 5 that we only have to ask for wisdom in your name and it'll be given. Father, we ask right now, give us the heart, give us the mind in this new year to devour your word as the good bread, as the good water, the living water that sustains us for all eternity. In Jesus' name. Number four, fight the good fight means that we praise him as much as we can. I've got this saying that I teach all of my clients. Whatever you celebrate thrives. Whatever you do not celebrate dies. Think about celebration as just a focal point of the energy in your heart, whether positive or negative. And celebration at its core can just be a simple thing where you're like, wow, thank you. I like to think about getting up in the morning and saying, oh, this is going to be great. And then before I go to bed at night, what I want to do is I want to look back on my day and go, yep, that was great. Think about it. If you simply have that honest ability to get up and look forward to your day, and before you go to bed at night, look back and think, oh, wow, this was a great day. And then you add all those up. A year, 2023, think about it. If you spend every day rejoicing and celebrating, well, your life is going to thrive. Your relationships will thrive because it's feeding it. You have a baby. What do you have to do? You have to feed that baby. You've got a plant. What do you have to do? You have to water and feed that plant. You can't walk it in the room and expect it to live. Celebration is the core of thriving in life. And the celebration that we're talking about right now is praising our Lord God. How much time in your day? Again, it's not pointing the finger, but please ask yourself. How much time in your day do you really spend praising the Lord? A real consolidated time of feeding the spirit within you. Of being before the Lord in gratitude with your arms outstretched, thanking Him. Or, men, let me ask you as the spiritual leaders of our home, how much time do we spend taking our family and praising the Lord together? The good news is, if you're looking at yourself, well, hmm, not much time. Well, you can only go on up, right? You can move on up to the east side. You've probably heard that somewhere before. You can move on up. And you can get better at this, but I guarantee you this. If you take even the month of January and carve out five minutes a day, just five minutes, to feed celebration in your life, in the beginning of your day, to look up and say, God, thank you, I dedicate this day to you. This day's going to be great. It'll set your mindset on great things. And then before you go to bed, look back and say, God, I thank you, and spend a moment just thanking him and praising him for being the almighty, righteous God. And you look back in your day and you're like, oh, this day was great. Even if you had hard things, even if you had mishaps, just watch what happens to your attitude and your ability to, ability to see good things. Because our ability to see the good depends on our vision. And our vision depends on our focus. And our focus depends on what we feed it. Because wherever you focus on, that's what you get in your life. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for being the almighty God of all creation. You are the God of the universe, God of the stars, the God of the atom. You orchestrate them all like a grand, ultimate maestro. And we come before you, God, praising you for your love. Help us celebrate these things that you've given us in all of abundance. In Jesus' name. Number five. Number five is the idea of joy. We want to be in joy in our life. Now, the Bible says, if any man lacks wisdom, let him ask. But we think about it. What is joy? Joy is different than happiness. Happiness is dependent upon what happens. And if something goes wrong, I don't know, like maybe your house floods because of water <laughs> that stopped up. I mean, can you ever imagine something like that happening? And no matter what it is, right, if we're dependent upon what happens, we will never be happy because, again, there are dark forces at work in this world. We can't be deceived. We can't be naive. But joy is something different. Joy is a choice. Joy is what you feed. Joy is really a, a byproduct of what we're doing with our lives. Joy, it says in Psalm 51, 12, Restore me to joy, the joy of my salvation. One of the things that helps people be the most joyful is if you just come through something hard. Suffering produces faithfulness. And in Hebrews chapter 5, we're saying, talking about Jesus Christ himself. It says, although he was a son, he learned obedience by those things which he suffered. 
You know, suffering. If you've ever gone through something hard or done something hard, the taste of victory after, the relief produces joy. And when things are so good in our lives, maybe we don't have anything that makes us suffer. That in and of itself, if we can keep a proper perspective, is something to celebrate and have joy about. Let's pray. Dear God, we confess our need for you. Fill us with your spirit, O God. Fill our lives afresh. At the start of each day, help us recognize you above all things. Enlighten our heart. Enlighten our eyes. God, help us to feed the spirit by communing with you. And even out loud. And in our conversations, God, season our words with thoughts of joy for you. Number six. We must contemplate our salvation in the heaven to come. Now, we're all guilty of this. I mean, think back over the last week. How many times have we talked about heaven with anybody that we've had a conversation with? Maybe even we can go a little deeper. How much have we even thought about heaven? One of the number one tactics I am convinced of, and it's an ancient, old, and tired strategy, but the enemy uses it very effectively with us. He did it to Adam and Eve in the garden, and he does it to us today. He wants to change our focus, change our minds, and get us to doubt God's sovereignty. Now, God's sovereignty in and of itself is the belief that God is up to something good, even when we can't see it. We know what Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1 says. It says, faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. Well, it takes a lot of faith to think to talk and to have conversations about heaven, does it? But the idea is that heaven is that ultimate reward. And when I, I can tell you about myself, when I focus on heaven, when I think about heaven, when I conceptualize what I believe heaven will be, and then when I share that with my family or anyone else, I can tell you it strengthens my faith. It strengthens it. My challenge to you in this new year, in this new month, hey, even just for today, even just today, what if you went out and you began to take some of your own questions about heaven and sought some answers? You know, we don't have all the answers, of course not. And maybe even with our best research and our theological studies, maybe we're right, maybe we're not. I don't know. But the idea, I think, is that if you will become a seeker of these things, you'll feed that in your heart and your mind, and heaven then becomes something to rejoice over. It becomes something to talk about. It becomes something for you to think about and look forward to in your life. Because one of the things I believe is this world is not our own. We're just passing through. Our treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. Heaven beckons me beyond that golden shore. You guys remember the rest of that verse? It's the whole idea about seeking heaven. Look it up this week. Look it up. Have faith. Talk about it. That's my challenge for you. Here's our prayer. Lord, we confess that we've got it so good that we don't even think about it. I mean, we've got heaven on earth with such riches and comforts. And God, we know we're a creature of the flesh. But God, forgive us in our worldly cravings. Forgive us in our updated this and that, getting the next best model. God, we want for nothing. But God, we realize heaven is real. And we realize that it's better than anything we can think or imagine. And so, God, I pray this very day that you give us the strength and the courage to seek out heaven, to talk about heaven, to study about heaven, to read about heaven, God, and to produce a, a forward-looking anticipation of the great things you have stored up for us. This mansion that you've created for us, right next to you, Father. I pray that you strengthen our hearts to desire this, to long for this, more than anything here on this earth. In your name. Number seven, the way that we fight the good fight is to tell ourselves about the hope we have in God. Another strategy of the enemy, and I see it all the time when I'm coaching people, is that we all create something I call unsolvable problems. Now, an unsolvable problem is something where we think there is no hope. We think that it's a problem that can't be solved. And that sounds big and grandiose, but just think about these little things in your life. Oh, there's nothing I can do about that. Oh, no, 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 that's just the way they are. That's an unsolvable problem. 
You see, but those of us who believe and hope in God, there's always an answer to a problem. All of our problems, there's always an answer. Now that's how great hope is. Because of people without no hope, those are people to be pitied. You know, the Apostle Paul talked about it. He said, we're all shipwrecked if Jesus hadn't created the hope for us in our salvation. There's hope. And if nothing else, if we put our hope in heaven, think about what we have. Now, as great as hope is, guess what? It's not the greatest. Guess what's better than hope? According to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Faith in love. That's right. What a powerhouse team they are, faith and love. And we already said faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. But let me ask you, what is love? 1 Corinthians 13 does a good job telling us what love is not. And a few things about what love is. And I encourage you today, get your Bibles out and read that chapter. Educate yourself. Get curious. Be fascinated about love. And why in the world is it called the greatest of all things? When we use that word, we spread it around coming up as Valentine's Day, right? There's, there's more than a little naked baby flying around with a bow and arrow. There's got to be something greater than that. So another challenge I have for you is research love. What is it? What in the world is the Bible talking about and why is it the greatest of all things? And when you do, watch what happens to your problems. When you put time and faith and energy and celebration about love, you'll see that you're surrounded by it. You know, God surrounds us with everything that we need. We ourselves need oxygen. Guess what? Oxygen's all around us. And so if we're surrounded by something, what do you think that means? Somehow, some way, we must need it. And we're surrounded by beauty. We're surrounded by love. That tells us something. Go research it. That's my next challenge for you. Let's pray. Lord, help us to hear you saying you are our hope. Like it says in Hebrews chapter 6, God, help us to know these things deeply in our hearts. God, you are our hope. You are our salvation. You are our faith. You are love. God, and you surround us and you're through us and you're in us. In all things, you're above us. And God, we worship you this very moment. I want to do something a little different this morning, if you guys would allow me, if you would indulge me. I want us to fight the good fight as a congregation by praying for one another. Would it be okay with you if I came down here and come out there and then we pray together for our last few minutes that we have left? Would that be okay with you guys? Excellent. I just want to ask everybody to gather around here. And if you have a specific need, allow us to pray for you as a congregation. Now, again, this is not a compulsion. Just if, if you would, I would ask that you stretch yourself. If you have a need... We would love to pray for you, but I need a good volunteer who would allow us, your church, your congregation to pray for you. Who would that be? Call us, O oh Lord, if you have something fun. <laughs> who would like to pray? Be prayed for. Oh, you can pray for me. All right, everybody, gather on up. Let's love on Mrs. Wicks. Come on up, everybody. Come on up. <clears throat> Come on up, everybody. You guys will get a hand in here as a congregation. The Bible tells us where two or more are gathered, there he will be with us in his name because we are in agreement in the Lord Jesus Christ. Anything specific that we can pray for you? Uh, for me, the future of, of our church, this, this congregation, this fellowship means so much to me. And I ask forgiveness every day for what I'm here for. Um, so I would just pray... My prayer is for this church. Amen. Let's pray. Father, you know our hearts. God, you know our minds. And you know our desire. God, we believe this church, as Mrs. Weeks has said, God, you know that this church is a good thing. It's a light for you. But beautiful, wonderful people that want to do things in your name to further your kingdom. God, we also know that the enemy, Satan, wants to destroy this congregation. He wants to bring doubt and frustration in our minds and our hearts because of pastors who can't stay. And, you know, he wants to, to make it so inconvenient to be here. God, we reject and we rebuke in the name of Jesus any thought that says give up, anything in our hearts that says, oh, it's too late. 
God, it is worth it. And fill us right now as a congregation, as a group of believers standing in this building, worshiping in your name. God, fill us with hope. Help us to see the pathway of growth. God, put it within us to work harder, to show up more, God, to do what it takes to build your kingdom. God, I pray in the holy name of Jesus that this congregation here in Warner Ridge, Arkansas, God, will grow tenfold over this next year, a hundredfold, that, God, these pews will be packed and people will come here seeing this church as a position, as a point of light and worship and the answers to their problems. God, show us what to do and bring this church, God, the leaders and the people who are willing to give. We're willing to sacrifice and passion to make it happen. In Jesus' name, we thank you. As if these prayers have already been answered, because we are praying them with faith, believing. Amen. Amen. Anyone else? Who else can we pray for? Our leaders. Our leaders. Yes, sir. Let's pray for our leaders. Father God, we want to pray right now. For our leaders, we've got locally, but within the state of Arkansas, we've got a new governor that's coming on board. God, and for this great nation, God, we really believe that you have blessed the United States of America, not because we're anything more special than any other people around the world, but because we have sought to bless you. We have proclaimed you as our center. We have pro proclaimed you as our God. We have dedicated this as one nation under God, and I pray, God, with repentance in our hearts that we will be restored to that. God, I pray that the people who you have put over us, God, will come to you and realize that you are the sovereign, and that they'll make their decisions based on the ruling of the country, which is the ruling of this people, that we will be restored. God, we see already, even in our media, whereas we have moved away from you, we're starting to creep back. Even the NFL is praying nationally, publicly, over a fallen uh, player. God, we thank you for that. And I pray that that catches like a wildfire, not just through the media, but through all the hearts and the minds of every man, woman, and child in this country, so that we exalt you as our Ebenezer, we exalt you as our standard, and that we make it known worldwide that the United States of America worships the one true God in all things that we do. And we set our standard, our government, our constitution on those things. In Jesus' name. Amen. Anyone else? This is the time, guys. Don't be shy. Come on up. Come on up here, sister. <clears throat> All right, guys. Yes, ma'am. Ladies, come on up here. <clears throat> Put your hand on that sister. God, you know <clears throat> our hearts. And when our family is broken, God, we are broken. We know your scriptures tell us that in the last days, we'll see families turn against one another. God, and I think that's just a sign of, of the ultimate most malevolent attacks of the enemy. And right now, in the power of the cross and the victory of Jesus, his defeat over death, God, we pray against the enemy and his attacks on the hearts and minds of the family. God, I pray right now that you will bless her family, that they'll have a sense of repentance and humility in their hearts to realize that being right isn't the ultimate thing. It's being loving. So God, change their hearts and minds. Get their focus from trying to be right to trying to be loving. Use them, God, as a reconciliation so that they can come together loving one another, checking themselves for righteousness' sake and bring healing. I thank you for our dear sister, that she is a light, she's a woman of righteousness. God, bless her tenfold in all things as she speaks out and leads <coughs> these people in your name. In Jesus' name. Anyone else, guys? <coughs> Come on up. Back up for you.
by yourself? <coughs> come on up here. Is this your brother? No. Boyfriend. Oh, boyfriend. <laughs> okay, come on. <laughs> hey, hey, hey. Uh, if you will. You see, you never can tell. All right, let's pray. You guys come on up, ladies. Can you come on up with her? Bless her. Righteous Father in heaven, God, um, we're heartbroken. Haley's grandmother has died and gone home. Sometimes God is beyond our reason, our, com our, our comprehension. Sometimes it's beyond our bearing to lose, to lose those that we love. And God, where our word, words fail us, I pray right now for Haley that you will strengthen her and surround her with support. Her and Parker, right now, Father, I pray, God, that you will bless them. Open their hearts and minds to the righteousness and the pathway of righteousness. And to love one another. God, I pray that you plug them into this family. Even though we can never replace her grandmother and we're thankful for her. God, I pray that she doesn't stop, but she continues to move forward with all of the lessons, with all of the goodness, with all of the life that her grandmother invested in her, raising her from an infant. And as she goes on honoring her grandmother by plugging into this church and being a good woman of honor, one that her grandmother can be proud of. Show her the way of celebrating life. Show her the way of worshiping you. And God, thank you that she has this family that loves her and wants her and needs her. In Jesus' name. Anyone else? Don't be shy. Call on me if you need me. Huh? And we thank the Austin and the Davis family. Yes. yes. Can you guys remind me of that situation? Uh, speaking of heaven, this one just speaking of heaven. Yeah. Uh, Vicky went to heaven the day after Christmas. Oh. Um, it's about four months from the time she got diagnosed with getting cancer. She fought hard, and uh, and uh, uh, her son Austin had these issues with substance abuse, and uh, he's been in the penitentiary the last couple of months. So he wasn't here when his mom passed, but he's getting to come home January 20th, and after that, then we have to start So uh, yeah, we've been thinking about that a lot because I said when you texted the she fell to heaven. Yes. Those of you who knew Vicki. All of us. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. What a wonderful woman. What a wonderful woman. And I had the privilege of speaking with her about her son. So anyway, I can help with that when he comes in. Please, please approve me. Let's pray. God, I'm just trying to keep it together. We love Vicky. Vicky. We still do. Present tense. We love her. Thank you, God, for the gift of her life. The way she poured into this congregation. <laughs> she was tough. Oh, so tough. And she fought. What an example. And you know that situation. Be with her and her family, be with Austin. God, God, we are not afraid of hard things. You have put hard things in our path, and it's the hard things that, you know, once we go through them, God, as hard as they may be, they're worth it. So it's going to be hard for us as a, as a church when Austin comes home. But God, I pray that just that we're there, your scriptures tell us that even if we just give a cup of water in your name, that's something great. And, and God, sometimes that baffles our minds. But when he shows up, God, I pray there's not one person in this room that's not willing to serve. Help us to show up and love on him as he grieves. God, I pray that we grieve properly. We're not taught how to grieve, but we know that that means being thankful for you and the gifts that we had while that person was here. And we also know that that's about sticking with you through our emotions. 
and look at the hand of God because anytime a piece of us is taken away, like Vicki was taken away from this congregation, it hurts. God, I pray that that draws us closer to you, not further apart. We know the enemy wants to come in and make us doubt you, take away our belief in your sovereignty. But God, we're not going to have it. This is an opportunity for us to draw together, and we will, to become stronger. I pray that we have a mindset to do what's needed, to do what's required, to love on Vicky's family, to draw to them, to serve them, to bring them here. God, use us as a facilitation of grief and healing, not indifference. In Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Sorry about the last couple of days. Mine's running too. Uh, thank you, guys. Thank you. Uh, this may be a little out of the ordinary for you, but I just really felt this on my heart to take this time to pray, to kind of practice what we preach. So if there's nothing else, you all please go ahead and find your seats. We wrap this up, sir.